The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, an artist's studio special, The Fight for Workspace in New York, an exhibition of 100 years of the artist's studio in London, and a photographer on capturing Paul Arago at work. As an exhibition opens at the Whitechapel Gallery in London, focusing on artists' studios over the last century, we thought we'd look in depth at the subject. The artist and activist William Palheider tells me about the Artist Studio Affordability Project, or ASAP, in New York, and how developers and gentrification have forced artists' communities to breaking point. I take a tour of the Whitechapel exhibition with the gallery's director, Evona Blaswick, and the photographer, Eamon McCabe, who's made a series of photographs of artists in their studios, talks about his encounter with Paul Arago. Before all that, the latest series of our sister podcast, A Brush With, is now complete. On the podcast, I talk to leading artists in depth about the influences and cultural experiences that shape their life and work. The last episode of this current series is A Brush With, I Way Way, so do subscribe wherever you get your podcast to hear that and to explore the catalogue of more than 30 conversations. And do also subscribe to this podcast and give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. It helps others to find us. Now, a growing phenomenon in major cities and centres for art around the globe has been the increasing difficulty for artists to afford studio space. Amid real estate booms and the increasing gentrification of communities that have traditionally been crucibles for art making and other cultural activity, artists have been priced out of their workspaces. In New York, the situation is perhaps more acute than anywhere in the world, and as a result, the Artist Studio Affordability Project, or ASAP, was formed in 2013 in an effort to alert the public and local politicians to the issue. ASAP advocates legislation that will protect and expand affordable artist studios. Among its members is the artist and critic William Powhider, and I spoke to him about what the group calls a crisis in New York's community of artists. William, the discussion around artist studios in New York has been a topic of debate for some time, hasn't it? Can you just set the background a bit? What kind of conditions have there been in New York in recent years, which have caused so much concern? Well, I would say since about 2013, the rise in the cost of running studios uh, has become really apparent to a lot of artists. And that was about the time that the Artist Studio Affordability Project started to kind of come into existence because Jenny Dubnow and some other artists in Industry City were actually displaced from their studios. And that there was a a sort of large number of artists who uh, lost their spaces and the developers, you know, were raising the rent significantly in a kind of step towards bringing in big box retailers and really transforming a whole area. And I think that's one of the examples of areas in the city that had been zoned commercial and had spaces that artists could use. And, you know, artists were there for decades and then sort of pushed out. And so I think there's like two issues that are really important. One is just the escalating cost of rents, which sort of surpassed like $3 a square foot, which in New York City really makes it unsustainable for artists and other small businesses. And so in that process of rising rents, you have a lot of displacement that happens to artists. And when artists are sort of pushed out of areas that they're working, they look for other areas with cheaper or affordable studio spaces, and which kind of contribute to that cycle of gentrification that we've sort of experienced in New York. So just a little context, areas in New York that had really strong artistic communities like Williamsburg, Brooklyn, Bushwick have seen, you know, a lot of the industrial and commercial spaces transformed into residential housing. And uh, the artists have just kind of been migrating throughout the city. And at this point, I can't really say in my experience that there's a strong artistic center grounded in affordable studio spaces for people to work in. 
And of course, one of the key things about the identity of New York as an art centre is those zones of creativity, right? Mm-hmm. So whether it goes back to Soho in the late 60s or whatever, it's it's always been driven, the kind of identity of the city has been so driven by those different movements that occur in different parts of the city, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. And I mean, I moved to New York City in 1998 in the fall and didn't really discover the Williamsburg art scene until I finished graduate school in uh, the early 2000s, but I found a vibrant artistic community where you had both artists with studios and galleries and nonprofits, you know, sort of working alongside one another, which created a really amazing dynamic. Um, You had a paper like the Brooklyn Rail, also publishing reviews and creating a kind of critical discourse. And right now it feels like in New York, without that kind of center, what we have are like clusters of galleries (laughs) moving, but we don't find them in the same proximity to artists uh, working. Okay. And tell me about the situation now. Obviously, it's very difficult to say what the reality is with COVID, but pre-COVID in 2020 or 2019, what's the situation in terms of artist studios and how much pressure through the artist studio affordability project have you been able to put on for instance, lawmakers or cultural leaders or anybody like that? Well, yeah, the pandemic has obviously complicated the situation in terms of um, I'm not even sure what the situation is right now because so many artists have left the city and we've been so focused on eviction moratoriums and residential housing. But my, my general feeling is that we were at the end of a period already by 2019, meaning that by the time Jenny Dubnow and others formed the Artist Studio Affordability Project to address displacement and rising rent costs, the problem was already apparent that it was really unaffordable and unsustainable. And so that led ASAP and some other groups of artists to start lobbying, say, our New York City Council for some form of like commercial rent. Uh, regulation of any kind. And so by you know, 2015, 2016, ASAP was really committed to something called the Small Business Job Survival Act, which really asked artists to look at themselves as small businesses and align themselves with other small businesses to put pressure on our city council to give us some tools to negotiate with landlords. Because right now in New York State, New York City, there is no commercial rent laws, really. I mean, it is just whatever lease you make with your landlord. So the SBJSA, uh, we put a lot of energy into pushing for this bill, which would at least give artists the ability to ask for like arbitration if there was a really high rent increase in between leases. And that also provided uh, like the option for a 10-year lease, which if you're an artist or a small business, knowing that you have a stable a place to do your business and a long-term lease option. It's really, it's really vital to like running a studio practice. The sad thing is uh, that bill SBJSA was essentially committed where it was just referred back to committee and never resurfaced despite the promises of, you know, a fairly progressive city council in the last couple of years before the pandemic, a city councilman named Stephen Levin had floated an actual commercial rent regulation bill. And that seemed to get a little bit of support before the pandemic. We were sort of optimistic, particularly within New York State. We had a a real democratic control of both the governorship and our state Senate. And it seemed like we might get some movement on some commercial rent regulation. Um, Unfortunately, that just kind of got wiped away during the pandemic. And in in my experience, one of the things that we faced um, is a lot of opposition from our groups like Rebney, the Real Estate Board of New York. During the SBJSA hearings, they sent you know, a small army of what I imagine to be real estate agents wearing blue hats that said no rent control, which was just a misrepresentation of the issue. No one's asking for like a capped 3% annual increase, but some form of rent guidelines for commercial rent. And so the, the short of it is, I feel like any policy that we we're trying to get enacted, that window has kind of passed. And I'm just not sure what the situation now is in terms of, you know, where the studio space situation is at. You know, I mean, real estate prices kind of took a hit in New York during the pandemic and then sort of really rebounded. But it it wasn't like the situation was in a good place before the pandemic, you know. So I think there may be some temporary opportunity for artists, but that... uh, 
again, does not address the kind of like root causes that had you know, been contributing to the rising costs of studio spaces over the last like two decades, really. One of the things that Jenny Dubnow, who you mentioned earlier, has written about is about the intersectionality of different elements of these political discussions and about for instance she's written about how when developers moved in opportunities were given to certain artists and what would happen was that more wealthy artists would move into certain areas and that would destroy the kind of grassroots community but whilst also giving the illusion that there was a healthy and thriving art community is that something that seems to happen quite widely as in it's a kind of art washing i guess that developers present a a, a front of supporting arts but actually the the actual grassroots community gets destroyed yeah i mean it's a sort of really tricky problem because one new york city is a place where a lot of artists who are educated elsewhere and move to the city and so you already have a kind of influx of people not from the communities which they move into which has a sort of pre-existing problem that new york has not (laughs) dealt or addressed very well, you know, in terms of like funding for community organizations that are sort of native to to the city. But on top of that, yeah, absolutely, developers, particularly in industry city where Jenny, you know, I believe had her studio, you know, the developers are happy to have artists there in an interim step while they shift out a lot of um, older businesses, you know, if the space is underutilized, bring in artists until the next step in the cycle of gentrification can happen, which is to then move the artists out and bring in retail, which, you know, and if artists are thinking of themselves as small businesses, when retail comes in, what they generally provide are like low wage jobs with like (laughs) very low ceilings for potential earnings. So it's not in the community's interest in some way to see, you know, like businesses and artists displaced because what comes after that is not necessarily going to be providing a lot of Uh, jobs for those communities. There's different forms of this where developers will, you know, create attractive sort of incentives for artists, free exhibition spaces, subsidized studios for a short period of time. But once the development is complete, you know, there's not sort of permanent spaces for artists in most cases. I think one of the things that about the pandemic is that there were all sorts of discussions about recovery and about how there were obviously great historic movements in which art was placed at the centre of recovery. It gave lots of opportunities to artists. Have you seen any kind of programmes put in place where that seems to be happening in terms of artist communities? Well, I think during the pandemic, the city had a grants program where artists were invited to apply for like a $5,000 grant and then put on some form of exhibition I saw a lot of shows that happened as a result of that money, but it was a sort of one-time influx of some money. And currently, New York State, I believe, is offering a program that's meant to help about 2,400 artists statewide that would provide about $1,000 a month in income for artists who can demonstrate the need. That's a very small number of artists to consider for the entire state. That is sort of the main initiative that I've seen Um, with any sort of public state funds. There's been some other emergency grants that are coming from private philanthropy. But I think the studio affordability crisis is one of those long-term things that really forces artists to say, you know, I can't stay here at all if I can't afford a working space. Because that, you know, is compounded by the high cost of residential rent, the high cost of living in the city. So individual sort of programs that set aside money for artists specifically are... I I wouldn't say that those are a bad thing, but I think if they really wanted to center the arts and support the arts in New York City, it would be by, you know, providing some sort of rent control or subsidizing some spaces long term for artists so that communities can actually form in a sort of healthier way (laughs) with existing communities that artists move into and develop longer term relations. I would like to see that, but um, right now, the rhetoric is so much focused on bringing back business um, that the arts are I think they'll be used to some degree but I'm not sure they'll be completely supported that's interesting and of course just giving grants to artists doesn't do anything in terms of the the basic problem of the affordability does it you can you can give all the grants you want but if you attack the root problem that artists cannot afford to pay for studios even if they get a thousand dollar grant then that's the way to actually ultimately create healthy and thriving art communities absolutely i mean i you know the grants are a short-term solution that provide necessary relief particularly 
during a period when a lot of artists weren't able to do their sort of day jobs. <laughs> and, you know, addressing the affordability crisis would go a long way uh, into kind of preserving the character of New York City, which I think the, the big risk is when you have a, a pandemic where a lot of artists don't see the benefits anymore of staying in the city and can find cheaper housing and workspace and create communities through upstate New York and Pennsylvania and surrounding areas, that New York just becomes a place for the distribution of artwork, a kind of retail showroom. And so that big box effect, unfortunately, could happen to the art scene here. And it would be a real shame to cut, you know, production and the discussion of what art is away from where it's shown and exhibited and sold. That's really unique, you know, to New York. And it, it does feel like a concern right now that a lot of people... Maybe we're thinking about leaving before the pandemic and then have this moment where, yes, you know, maybe it is time to, to rethink how we do this. One of the most effective studio projects in the UK has been Haifa Studios, where they've actually moved into communities where the economic effects have affected high streets, for instance. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that it'd be difficult to do that in New York because that, that effect on retail spaces, that effect on um, centres within local communities isn't the same in the sense that there's always somebody willing to move in in New York, right? So the, the economic downturn doesn't affect New York in the same way that it would those smaller cities that you were talking about. Yeah, I mean, the, the real estate prices in New York have been resistant to other downturns nationally, even during the financial crisis. There was a much lower dip here. The vacancy rates tend to be quite low, but, you know, sort of anecdotally, because the commercial rents had gotten so high prior to the pandemic, there was already waves of empty businesses in very wealthy neighborhoods like the West Village. You would see a lot of empty storefronts. And because of the way the laws are structured here in the city and the state, landlords could be incentivized to hold out for tenants that might be able to pay the going rates. And that hasn't necessarily been the case. And like the area that I live in in Bushwick uh, during the pandemic, there wasn't a mass exodus of people. People live here. <laughs> they're not, you know, they're not tourists. They don't own real estate as an investment. And so the community didn't radically empty out in the way that you might see in Manhattan, where there was the sense of, oh, let's just move people into empty businesses and empty storefronts. That wasn't the case here. But, you know, in the subsequent months, you know, leading into this year, I am seeing more empty storefronts as the kind of longer term effects of the pandemic and, you know, sort of inflation and all of these things have contributed to a lot more empty storefronts in communities that um, I can't say I could assume or, or, or take it for granted that the local economy will stay exactly the same, you know, which was, uh, you know, there were a lot of businesses here that would not necessarily benefit from an influx of artists if that meant gentrification. But if there are empty storefronts in spaces that are underutilized and the city could get artists into those spaces, that could be helpful. And if they actually just looked at it in a sort of more systemic and long-term way, really trying to identify some spaces that could provide subsidized studios for artists and really kind of slow down that sort of more vicious, insidious cycle of rising rents, artists moving to communities, not being part of those communities, bringing everything that sort of art brings, which Unfortunately, real estate people tend to follow along <laughs> and, you know, and look for, you know, development opportunities. So if the city were able to kind of maybe just commit to supporting some production sites for artists, uh, it could really help mitigate some of the effects of, of just the kind of cyclical nature of development, investment and gentrification. Fundamentally, it's about political will, isn't it? Yeah, and that is, I think, uh, the most depressing thing for me as an artist to have devoted a lot of energy and time to lobbying local city council people, going to city council hearings on these bills, testifying, being very vocal, trying to get other artists to engage with this process, and then seeing democratically elected, and I would say Democrats, you know, liberal Democrats, cave to either real estate interests or uh, perceived criticisms of kind of anything that might benefit, you know, artists exclusively. And that was certainly not the case with something like the Small Business Job Survival Act. It had nothing to do directly with the arts, but would benefit so many artists who have commercial leases. And so right now, I don't see a kind of path to that kind of political will to push back against the real estate industry. 
especially during a period of vulnerability where, I mean, New York City is in a really tough position. Like the Hudson Yards development, they built 60% office and retail space. And there is still a lot of people working from home. And those targets were not even being, like they weren't filling the office space they needed to before the pandemic. So, you know, it's weird to think about it, but I could imagine that the city might have available space for artists and some of the most kind of like luxurious developments that they put into place um, if things sort of continue on as they are. That would indeed be a curious development. But thank you, William, very much for joining us today. Thank you. You can read more about ASAP at artiststudioaffordabilityproject.org and about William's work at williampalhida.com. Coming up, we discuss a century of the artist studio at the Whitechapel Gallery and Eamon McCabe tells us about photographing Paula Rago. But first, here are a few of the top stories on our website this week. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has begun and the effect on communities, culture and heritage in the country is inevitably causing concern. Moments after Russian President Vladimir Putin announced a special military operation on Thursday morning, attacks were reported in the Ukrainian capital of Kiev and major cities including Kharkiv, Mariupol and Dnipro. Western leaders say the move could trigger the biggest war in Europe since 1945. The latest developments come after Putin declared the rebel-held regions of Donetsk and Luhansk in eastern Ukraine as independent states on Tuesday and sent so-called peacekeeping forces there. Over the past few weeks, as Russia amassed hundreds of thousands of troops on the borders, Ukrainian museum workers have been quietly preparing evacuation plans for their collections and instating free admissions to help their communities, quote, combat stress. In the Russian culture sector, meanwhile, fears are growing that the latest Western sanctions will only exacerbate the already existing, quote, unwritten boycott against Russian artists that was triggered by the annexation of Crimea in 2014. This week, in a show of Solidarity with Ukraine, the Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco projected works from the Mistetsky Arsenal in Kiev on its facade. The US has introduced an immediate four-year import ban on a wide range of art and antiques from Afghanistan. As Ivan McQuiston reports, the emergency measure, which came into force on the 18th of February and will last until at least the 28th of April 2026, aims to prevent the looting and trafficking of archaeological and ethnographical material. The US State Department authorised the move under the Cultural Property Implementation Act. However, cultural property experts who advise the US government on collecting and the art market fear the policy may result in any material being handed over to the Taliban. And finally, Alistair Hudson has reportedly been asked to step down from his post as director of the Whitworth Art Gallery in Manchester, UK, after a controversial statement of solidarity with Palestine displayed in an exhibition last year sparked a furore. The show, entitled Cloud Studies, was devised by the investigative agency Forensic Architecture and examined human rights violations linked to air toxicity in Lebanon, Syria and the US, as well as Palestine. According to the Guardian newspaper, Hudson was asked to leave by the University of Manchester, which runs the Whitworth following a series of complaints by UK lawyers for Israel who claimed that the exhibition contained serious inaccuracies and that no attempt had been made by the gallery to check them. In a statement on Twitter, Forensic Architecture, whose founder, I.L. Weisman, was born in Israel, stated it was shocked and enraged at this blatant punishment and vengeful attempt to suppress solidarity with Palestinians. You can read all these stories and much more at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS and Android, which you can download from the App Store or Google Play. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. As the 20th, 21st century art season returns to Christie's, discover masterworks by modern and contemporary icons across sales in London and Shanghai. With a stellar and unprecedented lineup of works and artists, the Relay Livestream format on 1st of March is set to capture the excitement as Christie's fields in bids from its four major auction sites Shanghai, Hong Kong, London, and New York. Marvel at the remarkable works in a dialogue across centuries and geographies, from Lucien Freud's Girl with Clothes eyes and Francis Bacon's triptych 1986-7 to Franz Marc's The Foxes and Pablo Picasso's La Fenêtre Ouverte as well as other incredible works. Auction highlights are on view at King Street until the 9th of March. Discover more on Christie's.com. <laughs> 
Welcome back. Now, just open at the Whitechapel Gallery in London is A Century of the Artist Studio, 1920 to 2020, a vast show of close to 200 works by more than 80 artists from across the globe. It explores the shifts in art over the past 100 years and, as a result, the changing nature of studio spaces. I went to the Whitechapel to speak to the gallery's director, Ivana Blaswick, who led the team of curators that organised the show. Ivona, we're standing in the space that's called Performing the Studio now. We've just had a sort of introductory section where there are sort of rather than conventional photographs of artists in their studios. But suddenly in here, it seems to just all explode. Yeah, I mean, for literally, literally hundreds of years, when we saw the atelier, it was very, very much a studio with a north-facing skylight probably an easel and definitely a man. Uh, And if there were any females, they were lying naked on a couch. And that is the kind of conventional idea of the studio, really up until the beginning of the 20th century. And then it just does explode. And we see how suddenly there's a transition also from the paintbrush to the camera. And I think that's really, really significant because it enables artists to, first of all, photograph themselves and also to see the studio as a work of art in its own right. And Bruce Nauman famously says in the late 60s or 70s, if I'm an artist, then when I'm in the studio, anything I do is art. And that's the big kind of transition. But the other one is, of course, the entry or the acknowledgement Um, of female artists and then through later, much later in the century, artists of colour and then the world itself. You know, we've, we've for so many years understood the history of art as being a Western construct and yet we know there have always been, certainly in the 20th century, multiple modernisms and I think within this survey we're trying hard to say, look, this was not the province of a few white guys (laughs) in Northern Europe. So that's part of the kind of ethos of the exhibition. Should we look at Kerry James Marshall's Untitled Painter? Because that seems to me there's so many different aspects of the show that you've just mentioned there that are contained within this one rather small painting, actually. I mean, what we see is, in a way, it does go back to someone like Artemisia Gentileschi, who she portrays herself with a palette as a kind of attribute of the artist. So all of the works in this section really present the artists who is showing themselves to the world and they're using the studio as a kind of mise-en-scene, which is part of their skill set, it's part of who they are. It's one of their, their official attributes. And Kerry James Marshall shows us a black woman painter and she's standing in the middle of the painting with that very confident hand on her hip and in the foreground is a gigantic palette which is almost as big as she is in fact almost larger and it's almost like a shield and behind her are lines left behind where a canvas has been when we look at that I think the first thing we we think of is actually Richard Diebenkorn you think is that a kind of abstraction and he says of this painting he observes that there are so many black artists today who've taken up the mantle of European history painting or the conventions of the swagger portrait to insert the black body, the black figure within canonical art history. But he says, why should we only be associated with figuration? We can do anything. We are as universal a figure as any white male. And so what he shows us, I think, is three kinds of abstraction. The female figure who stands glinting with a little gold nose stud and and golden earrings. So she's in that tradition of the Swagger portrait, but behind her is a linear abstraction, geometric abstraction. On On her apron is a kind of almost abstract expressionism. And in the foreground is something akin to Tashism. And I think that's very, very consciously trying to tell the story of modern art and placing her bang in the middle of it. It's really interesting because there's, in a way, as you say, it, it, it explodes 
the condition of painting to a degree, but it's also sort of reverent to painting, isn't it? Whereas the work behind us, and we must say we're in a noisy room because there's lots of video works here, right? Yeah. And behind us is a video room which features the film Painter by Paul McCarthy. And I don't know if we can stress enough what an assault on the senses this work is. Yeah, I mean, in this cacophonous space, we see literally performing the studio an LA-based artist who is taking at the core of his performance the figure of the heroic abstract expressionist painter. He was inspired by the photographs that were taken of Abex painters in the 1950s and published in glossy magazines. Vogue, for example, might do a big feature on, or Life magazine, on Jackson Pollock. He'd always have a cigarette, he'd always have a glass of whiskey, and the, this ethos of this heroic genius became very bound up in ideas about America itself. And Paul McCarthy's work is always multivalent. It might be looking at a history of art, but it's also looking at the nature of American culture. And in this film, he has upcycled an abandoned TV set, actually, which has these kind of... You can see the walls are a set. And he goes in a circle from his studio where he's telling us how to paint abstract expressionist painting to his dealer, to a TV studio where a couple are talking about collecting, to finally a special viewing room where clients are invited to sniff his bottom. (laughs) It's hilarious but harrowing. He's wearing gigantic rubber fingers and a huge wobbly nose. And at one point he takes a machete and hacks his fingers off as a kind of form of symbolic castration. (laughs) So it's parodic clown-like, but there's also something very, very violent, very much about a kind of infantilism, highly sexualized ethos of the idea of the male genius painter. There there are a series of big tubes of paint in there, aren't there? And one of them says shit on it. So it's it's so caught up in, of course, the psychology of what it it is to be an artist as well. And a kind of scatological idea about what painting is and how it goes right back to early atavistic, childlike impulses. But also it's highly sexualised. His gigantic paintbrushes are like huge phalluses. And he talks about jars of mayonnaise as being like female genitalia. So the whole thing is a kind of assault, as you say, on the senses. And it's looking also about this idea of virility and American exceptionalism and this kind of circuit that he makes between studio, gallery, collector's sitting room and back again is a, a, a critique not only of the kind of echo chambers of the art world itself and its insularity, but of America as a self-absorbed centre of empire. We're all fascinated by it, but it's actually utterly um, insular. And it's also, I think, to do with rugged individualism and all of those kind of values that were associated with abstract expressionist art. Let's go and look at some artists who use studio as a form of installation. Ivana, tell us what we're looking at here. This really is a studio entering our space, isn't it? And what we have here is actually an art history legend, which is by the German artist Kurt Fitters. It's called the Mertz Bau. It was produced in his house in Hanover in 1922, and it grew to incorporate about eight different rooms. Uh, but sadly, it was bombed by the British in 1944. And yet, it's the stuff of legend. What he did was to create a whole series of stalactites and stalagmites made of wood and white plaster, which invaded the entire space. And he invited his friends, his Dada friends, like Hannah Hock, for example, Raoul Hausmann, Hans Arp, to come and donate works of art to this thing. He also stole things from him. Apparently, he stole Sophie Talbot Arp's bra. How he got it off her, I have no idea. But it was buried in the depths of this strange construction, which we've recreated here. And it was a kind of reliquary, but it was also like a three-dimensional collage, which made into spatial terms the, the stuff of his very famous and very radical collage technique. But he made it out of planes, out of... Uh, triangular profiles and within that hid not only works of art donated by Dada artists but also things like their urine 
uh, hair clippings and so forth. So it was almost like a religious reliquary. The quality of the installation was such that everyone who visited got lost and also thought that it was colossal because you'd see these vaulting shapes going up through the ceiling. He penetrated the floor, and they thought they were in a gigantic hall, like a cave of different facets. But in fact, it was a series of small rooms. So we we just couldn't miss the opportunity to revisit one of the most influential proto-installations in the history of art. Let's go and look at artists who are using the studio as a kind of stage set. So we wanted to show that the making of modern art, of contemporary art, is a global phenomenon. And so we looked to Africa and, in fact, to our own history of the Whitechapel Gallery, which I think it was in 1996, made an exhibition called Seven Stories of Africa. And we remembered from that that there was this very extraordinary group from Senegal called Laboratoire d'Agit Art, And this was a group of artists, performers, painters, musicians, and dancers who would set up an outdoor studio in Dakar, and they would draw on very ancient rituals to do with drumming, performance, and so forth. Uh, They would use masks and animal skins, again, drawing on this and an ancient culture which had been erased by French colonialism. At the same time, they utterly resisted their own government's desire to propagandise art. They'd set up official tapestry studios, for example, and they rejected that as well. And they wanted to find an art which transcended disciplines. And all of the teaching at that time in in Senegal was through French Beaux-Arts traditions. And so we see in a series of photographs here, taken uh, in the 1990s, this series of performances where we have the performers wrapped in cloth, almost like they're mummified, Mm -hmm. and they would enact uh, a kind of ritual of metamorphosis. Uh, Using ancient rituals and myths, they would incorporate them into dances, moves. They created, for example gravestones. So it was about resurrecting the past, uh, but at the same time creating modern art. And we see them painting on the floor, painting on the walls, and it's truly a kind of Gesamtkunstwerk. There are these fantastic banners that they made, which are marvellous, kind of vividly coloured abstractions. And they are put in juxtaposition with, for example, a leopard skin, which itself has been painted and embroidered. So it's a marvellous kind of cross-disciplinary fusion, but also the idea of the studio as a place where people come together to perform. And they would move that. This is actually from, I believe, a residency they did in Delfina Studios. Mm -hmm. So this studio would effectively move around. It could move around the world. So we've gathered together artists who really use the studio more like a film set. It's lights, camera, action. They've got props, they're using costumes, they're using all of the kind of equipment that you'd need to shoot a film or or stage a play. And we see it in also a self-reflective way where they are either using it to create these kinds of mise-en-scene that we see in the work of Rotimi Fanny Coyote, great Nigerian artist who lived and worked in London in the 1980s, uh, in his tribute to Caravaggio. Or you see Tracy Emin, for example, who set up a studio in a commercial gallery in, in Sweden, in Stockholm, in 1996, having had some very, very critical, very kind of odd press reviews uh, about her Turner Prize uh, exhibit of her bed. And she locks herself in the studio, drills a hole in the wall so that the public can look at her through a peephole, immediately putting them in the role of wire. And she herself is the model, but the title of the work is The Model Goes Mad. And she becomes both model and artist, both the subject and the object of the work. Is the peephole a Duchamp et en donné reference? Absolutely, yes, it must be, it must be. Very, very clever, so it relates both to art history and also to our salacious interest in the naked female body. Fantastic, let's go upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, we, we mentioned that downstairs there was a sort of cacophonous space. This is almost chapel-like in its serenity. And we're going to look at this extraordinary work by Alina Shaposhnikov. And this is taking the most humdrum of materials, chewing gum as a sculptural material. Tell us about it. So in this group of works, we're looking at the secret life of the studio. When the artist isn't there, uh, we have paintings before a work of art is even made. We have paintings of studios where the students have just left. So they're scarred and tattered and uh, the kind of index of all the different artists who went through them. But we're also looking at materials and what happens to them when we're not looking. Um, and Szepochnikov, who is a Polish artist but living and working in Paris, you know, clearly didn't have much money <laughs> or resources and made these wonderful experiments with chewing gum but photograph them so they look like performers or, or indeed large-scale sculptures. And in this display, we've kind of slightly taken license and imagined what would a piece of chewing gum do if it was a gymnast you know, a, a, or, or a model when the artist isn't looking? And you can see it swinging from, from shelves, doubling back on itself, getting itself in a knot, uh, and then lying down to take a rest. At one point, it's a reclining figure. It could be a kind of an endless column. It takes all of the kind of tropes of modern sculpture. And yet, as you say, it's the most humble of materials, and it's made by mouth. What I love about this work is the artist can't have been thinking, I'm going to put this in a gallery, I'm going to do this, that, or the other with it. It feels so such an instinctive kind of natural process, a, a process which is sort of entirely private in a way. Yeah. Well, there's a deep structure in a way to this exhibition, which is the public and the private. And there's a, a kind of very, I think, strong distinction between those two. The moment when the artist chooses to present their process, their body, their activity to the public. And those moments of pure experimentation, the need for failure, the need for boredom, uh, the need for complete isolation, to just doodle. And in a way, these are kind of those doodles that through the lens of the camera take on the status of art. And they're both amazing photographs and mini sculptures. Let's go into the next room. We're in a section called the Intimate Studio, and we wanted to look at practitioners for whom they may have had, for example, a very intense relationship with a sitter, because there is a, an intimacy, an unguardedness. There's a basis of trust between the sitter and the painter. If you're going to take your clothes off and lie on a couch, you don't want a public audience, and you need to trust each other. And so we have some amazing paintings of Frank Auerbach, uh, Lucien Freud's portrait of his friend David Dawson, and Francis Bacon, who himself never, ever had a sitter in his studio, but would simply reach down to the mulch of detritus on the studio floor, and that was what, you know, where he drew his inspiration. They are, of course, iconic figures. They've been celebrated. They've been highly documented. And I think Bacon in particular, because of his interest in photography, also drew photographers to him. And his, that split between the public dapper uh, flaneur, uh, who was quite a dandy, impeccably dressed, and then the, the squalor, really, <laughs> of the studio, which was tiny. It was a very small apartment. And it's almost like you can see this Jekyll and Hyde or... It's like an alter ego or the unconscious mm. played out in the space of the studio. We wanted to also look at the very different kind of dynamic and aesthetics of paint in a room versus camera in a room. Mm, yeah. And, and, and so now we're looking at Francesca Woodman, who I've seen her photographs on numerous occasions, but they never cease being haunting and spectral and elusive, so elusive. We've made a, a kind of pairing between a very early French photographer called Florence Henri, who um, I have to thank my colleague Dawn Addis for bringing her to our attention. And there's a, a self-portrait where she's photographed herself in a mirror, 
with mirrored balls at the base of it, as if she's rising out of the floor, as if she's only a torso. We've put that right next to a series of self-portraits by Francesca Woodman, also using a mirror. And she says, the title of the work, A Woman, A Mirror, A Woman is a Mirror for a Man. So it's a very kind of strange um, take on her identity and her image. And what you see also is that the studio is refracted into the mirror itself. And we see how she makes her body part of the architecture, the interior of the studio. So the studio becomes her psyche. I think it's almost like her unconscious. And we see through these photographs where she's naked, there's a whole series where she's almost hiding or camouflaging herself against the walls of the studio. But we have showing for the very first time in Britain, from 1979, a series of photographs she made in colour, which I had never seen before. No, they're completely unusual. And they're very beautiful. And you see perhaps a more conventional reading of a beautifully dressed young woman looking in a mirror, and then you see her literally climbing up the walls. So it's almost like she's contained by the image and then she's trying to escape it or climb out of it or kind of fold herself into the architecture of the studio. It's the, the, the architecture is so bare as well. That's what, you, know, you talk about the psychology of these works. That sort of bareness, you inevitably speculate about the bareness of the psyche, the, the laying bare of, yes. the, of, of her mental state. Yes. I mean, of course, we're reading into that her biography, which sadly she died by suicide. So... Of course, the work is freighted a little with that, isn't it? Yes. I think once you know that, it really does affect one's reading of the work because in some ways it's very playful. And you sort of think of her as almost like an Alice in Wonderland, someone who's finding a fantastical series of uh, adventures in the most austere, bare, inhospitable kinds of rooms. They're certainly not domestic. But... She sees in them these, all these possibilities of the interaction between the body and the architectonics of space. Um, and she folds herself into them. Uh, she makes herself part of their geometry. And it's only later that you realise, of course, that it was also a very tortured relationship she had with her, with her psyche. So this is the work of the Taiwanese artist Te Ching Se, who was a performance artist but specialised in a particular kind of durational performance which for most of us would seem an utterly unthinkable task, right? Oh, he's certainly one of the most extreme... the extreme dedication to life as art. For example, he was tied to another performer for a year. I think it's Linda Montana that they had to coexist, they had to use a bathroom, they, had to, they weren't in a relationship but they had to be tied just to see what kind of encounters they would have through the city in that relationship. And in in the work that we have here, it's a one-year performance that he made in 1980, which is about clocking in and clocking out of the studio. It's about the labour of art, and he is documenting it in every hour. And we see his hair growing... Um, at one point it's very, very shaved, and then next you see it's very, very long. And he's looking at it as a kind of existential statement about the nature of being an artist, that life itself is his work of art, but that it requires discipline, uh, it requires absolute dedication, that whatever happens, that rigour is part of the work of art, if it is only this idea of the uh, clocking in. And he makes an analogy, of course, with industrialization, with being a factory worker. And yet, he, in a way, liberates that because it's entirely pointless what he's doing. It's, it has no productivity attached to it. Just within viewpoint from here, we, we have Egon Schiele's drawing, which to me is just such an extraordinary work because so much of his work is informed by a representation of the body and the problematics around that. But here we have his humble studio space. Tell us about this. So in 1916, uh, Schiele was conscripted but deemed too weak to fight in the Austrian army. So he was made into a prison guard, and he was a guard in a prisoner of war camp. And what we see is an incredible drawing of the office, 
very bare, very bleak office. There are lists, we imagine, of the prisoners who are there. There's a stove, there's bits of bureaucracy, bits of filing, paperwork. But in the foreground is his salvation. And what it is, is it's an open box of pens and pigments. And this is his studio. This is his escape hatch. And I find this drawing incredibly powerful. Not only is he such a consummate draftsman that he can make the most appalling, banal office interior, and an office associated with something as a terrible as a prisoner of war camp. And within that, he shows us the possibility of art. So it's another take on a studio, that it can just be something you carry with you. We're in the very final moment of the show now, and you mentioned sort of humdrum objects there, and this is full of humdrum objects, and yet it's utterly spectacular, right? Yeah, I mean, this is a portrait, if you like, of the studio of an artist called Walid Beshti, who's based in Los Angeles, and he has made a cyanotype of every single tool, invoice, leads, bit of computer that is scattered across the floor of all the surfaces of his studio. And the thing about the cyanotype is that it's a, it's a form of solarization. The photographs are just blue and white, and they have an aura. They glow. So he's taken the sort of most banal aspect of production, screwdrivers, there's even, of course, a bottle of beer, and made them into something that has an aura. And it's the most beautiful portrait, I think, of the life, work, and times of an artist. It's about transformation, isn't it? It's about this is what artists do. They enter into spaces and they create moments of transformation, right? Yeah, I think that alchemy is absolutely key to this. Something so simple. And yet, we didn't think of it, you know, that he could look at a screwdriver and see its potential. Of course, it relates to early abstract photography in the 20th century, Maholi Nage and uh, all the experiments that were made, Man and also Ray. way back to Anne Atkins in the 19th century, yes, early photography, yes. you know, yeah. But there was a kind of idea of absurdism, all taking from nature. And what I think is very original about this work of art is that it takes the tools, but also the life of the artist. Um, he has included some of his bills. And what we really see is every aspect of that activity and the complexity of what it takes to run a studio and make art. The technical prowess of this is also awesome, as someone who's tried and failed to make <laughs> cyanotypes, I often think, how on earth did he do this? They're in such perfect profile, these white, ghost-like images that shimmer across this gigantic blue mural. Yeah, but it's also on really humdrum paper as well. Again, humdrum objects on newsprint, on bits of cardboard, you know. So it's not like he's using the, the highest form of technical devices in order to realise it. And yet, as you say, it's so immaculately realised. Yeah. It's one of those show-stopping works, I think. Uh, I'm, full disclosure, it was, I first saw it at the Barbican Curve, where it's like ten times the size. And indeed, we have many boxes of cyanotypes that we couldn't even fit into our space. Because as I remarked to you, you know, the only space we haven't used at the Whitechapel Gallery is the ceiling. It is possibly <laughs> the most packed show we've ever done. Uh, but it was partly because there's so much great work about the subject of the studio. There is indeed. Ivana, thank you so much. Thank you so much. A Century of the Artist Studio, 1920 to 2020, is at the Whitechapel Gallery in London until the 5th of June. And finally, it's time for Work of the Week. The photographer Eamon McCabe has, over many years, taken photographs of artists in their studios, a group of which was given by Eamon to the National Portrait Gallery in London. Among the many studios he visited was Paula Rago's London Atelier in 2004, when she was in the midst of making her series Possession, a sequence of coloured pastel drawings depicting her assistant and alter ego, Lila Nunez, on a couch, adopting poses inspired by photographs purportedly showing states of hysteria, staged in the 19th century by the neurologist Jean-Martin Charcot. I spoke to Eamon about this shoot and his wider artist studio project. Eamon, you developed two parallel series of photographs that 
went into creative spaces. Can you tell us a bit about the background to that? Yes, these two things did run in parallel. I managed to get a contract with the uh, Royal Academy to do artist studio visits. And almost at the same time, The Guardian came up with this idea of doing writer's rooms. So I had myself a really nice piece of glass. If you can imagine, the most important thing was to have a wide lens that wouldn't distort because you couldn't have the edges just falling off. Best thing I ever bought, actually, that Hasselblad lens, because I got so many good pictures out of it. And basically had a tripod, a simple lighting system, and I was very keen with the writer's room side of it, was, don't forget, in in that series, there was no body in the picture, it was just their rooms. And I was trying to show how writers wrote and what turned them on and what, you know, sort of encouraged them. But in the artist studios, I was very keen to have the artist in the studio. And, you know, looking back on it now, the, the artist uh, studios, are, to me, are more interesting now because I've got their personalities. And some of them have died, sadly, and some of them are still thriving. Both were great series, but it was strange that they should run parallel from two different contracts. Indeed. And tell me about that experience before we talk about this particular work we're going to talk about. I'm really interested in, did you get a range of greetings, as it were, as you entered into those artist studios? Were were some more protective than others? Were most of them very open to how you interpreted that space? The artists themselves were, were very open. Um, the only one I had problems with was uh, Howard Hodgkin, great Howard Hodgkin, who uh, I, I was thrilled to get access to his studio you know, and uh, met the great man and his assistant and we all got on very well. And I said, sir, can I go and have a look at the studio? And I get to the studio and all the paintings are facing the wall. I've got nothing to look at except the (laughs) great man. And it, it was, I think, a superstition of his own that he, you know, if he was working on something, he turned it to the wall until he was ready to work on that particular piece. But as a photographer, I just had 10 blank frames to look at. But we got on very well and to be fair I did get some pictures later and I did get one or two that he was working on and he did turn the other way but my heart did sink. And the thing with these great people, writers or artists, is that you treat them with respect. It's a privilege to go into somebody's studio, somebody's writer's space and you've got to be a bit careful, you don't sort of push it too much. So you can't say, oh, come on, Howard, turn him around. You know, it just doesn't work <laughs> like that. We're going to talk about Paul Arrego. And, and, and it's really interesting. The work that's actually a part of that set that you gave to the National Portrait Gallery is, is, a, is a sort of closer cropped portrait of her. But actually, the image that we're going to talk about is, is a slightly more distant image. And it's so fascinating because it's a dialogue with the, with the works that are around her. Yeah, I was very fortunate. Um, Paul Arrigo uh, studio is an old garage in Camden Town. And I love the idea of knocking on these doors and seeing what's behind this door. It's a lovely, lovely, uh, exciting time. You know, will it be well lit? Will it have daylight? Um, All these kind of issues as a photographer, you get, you know, we're all wound up in any case before we go on a job. But these little things help the light, the atmosphere. And I get there and the studio is wonderful. It's full of models, um, dummies, if you like, things that she's created and a lot of her art, obviously very, very serious, interested in feminine issues, very strong imagery. And I noticed um, on the f- far wall when I went into the studio, there was four paintings of a, a woman that in my first looking at it looked like she was in therapy. And she was in various guises on, on a, a sofa type thing. And I just said to Paula, I said, um, you see those paintings up on the wall? You wouldn't still have that dress, would you? Because if I could get you into that dress and get you against those paintings, it would be fantastic. And she laughed. She had the most wonderful laugh in Europe. She was fantastic. (laughs) And even though her work, I find very serious and quite difficult at times, but her spirit is lovely and loose and friendly. But her spirit was wonderful. And she said, OK, I'll go and get it. Now, fortunately, I had an assistant with me, uh, Beth, Beth Elliott, and I said, Beth, go and go and help Paula into the dress, because Paula said, oh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to fit into this. It's uh, a bit tight. But with some pins, the old photographers trick pins and draw and uh, safety pins and 
bulldog clips. Always take, always take some bulldog clips with you. They're the great <laughs> things. We managed to sort of wedge her into this dress. Fortunately, the setup for the original paintings was still there. A couple of sofas kind of intertwined. And as she sat down, all the bulldog clips, all the pins just burst. And she gave me this most wonderful laugh. And I had that laugh. And at the, I just had my picture. I could have gone home then. It was the first picture I took. But it said Amazing. everything about Paula because you had the serious work in the background. The studio was on these uh, kind of small sofa type things. And then this beautiful smile. And she's got the best teeth in Europe. And it was just, <laughs> it all came together. And it was all out of an accident. Um, you know, what made me ask her to put the dress on? Why did the pins all break and burst all over the studio? But we had our picture. And in, in a way, that was the centre picture. But I did do a lot of detail. She makes these mannequins for her various artworks. And there was a lot to look at in the studio. And um, it was a privilege to be allowed to wander around somebody's private space, to photograph every little nook and cranny, to, to my heart's delight. And it was like being a kid in a sweet shop, being let loose in an artist's studio. And of course, the one thing I loved about doing that series was I was hoping some of it would rub off on me and I become a better photographer. That's really interesting. Do, do you feel that it did change the way that you photographed? Of course, it's a very different kind of photography to other kinds of photographs that you had made because you've done reportage photography, right? You've done fast moving photographs where you, where it's all about that decisive yeah. moment. So so tell us about that dialogue that you had with, the, with in a way with the, the whole process of making images. Yeah, I started off as a sports photographer on The Observer way back in the 70s and 80s. And I was very much on the edge of things, looking in with a long lens, taking what I could, but no interaction. You know, you can't say to um, Gary Lineker, can you look this way while you're scoring a goal? It doesn't work that way. <laughs> you're an observer. And it's probably when I was young, you know, uh, that was probably the right place for me to be observing. As you get older, you get more confident. And I went into Howard Hodgkin, I went into Paula Rigo, Maggie Hamling, with some sort of experience and confidence. So when they said, what do you want to do? I could direct it. I could say, could we do this? Now, where that came from, I don't know, over the years, experience. But that's the difference, really, going from an observer to a director, to becoming somebody who doesn't leave until they get what they want. Whereas when I was young, I was glad of anything I got. And I, I'm, I'm quite conscious of that change. I'm interested in, in how much you prepare ahead in terms of the work, because it seems to me, you know, as you, you had a dialogue with the work, as we, as we discussed mm. there, is it important that you know what the artist's work looks like before you go in, or can you go in completely cold? No, you do mug up. You sort of look at the work and see, are they, are they wild? Is it a wild style? Is it gentle? Is it landscapes? No, I think you pay them the respect of looking at their work. Often it would be maybe to go with a show that's about to come out. So you'd, you'd mug up on that show. And, um, you know, I've done Hockney. And, you, you know, when he was in France doing his huge landscapes, you know, you, there's no way I could recreate that. But I, at least I could talk to him about it and say, how do you do it? And then he was telling me he did a lot of the painting out of the back of a van driving around and I thought that was wonderful I think probably what I have got is I've got an ability to get on with people certainly for half an hour and you know that that I then try and get as many different pictures as I can and the great thing about artists is they understand why you want to take another picture politicians are the worst they don't understand <laughs> why you want to take another picture they think a picture is a picture is a picture um, I tell you who are the best the best are poets Poets are lovely. Poets just can understand why you want to take all day because they're used to working all day and not getting anything for it. And, that you know, that's, that's the lovely thing about poetry. But painters are very close to uh, poets. Painters understand light, backgrounds, um, why you want to move around, why you want a, uh, a different emphasis on, in a room or with, or with the artwork. So at least I'm with my, my, my brethren, my brothers, if you like, and sisters in that, way, in that respect. They know what a struggle it is and they can see me struggling and they help. They really do help. <laughs> 
Heyman, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you. You can see Eamon McCabe's portraits of Paul Arago on his website, which is eamonmccabe.co.uk. And that's all for this episode. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julie Mahalska, Amy Dawson, Henrietta Bentel and David Clack. And David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to this week's guests, William, Ivana and Amy. And thank you for joining us. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.